Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express, where we are still in Venice. And so we have a lot to get to tonight, but I'd like to thank all of our listeners and all of our cast members who are assisting us in the listening and creation of this episode. We could not do it without you. And so we have a rather full table tonight. More on that later. I would like to start off introductions to my right. Hi there, this is Mike, and I'm playing James Robert Fraser. And I think I've just seen a ghost. I think that's quite possible. Uh, But we'll see if we can get a chance to confirm it maybe a little later. To his right. Hi, I'm Rena. I play Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy, and I think I may have a date with my brother? Question mark. I mean, why would you? Why would you put a question mark there? No idea. Why would you? Indeed. Uh, at the end of the table. Hi, this is Charles, and I'm playing Simon Griffith, and I just let Maggie do Simon's job for him, spelunking. Yeah, you know. I have a feeling that your job might come up tonight. We'll see about that. Uh, to Mr. Griffiths, right? Hi, I'm Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger, and I've yet to be able to get a leg up on the situation here in Milan. Well, I'm sure you'll be running it down as soon as you can. Uh, to Miss Bellinger's right. I'm Martin, and I'm playing Richard Courtney, and uh, Richard just doesn't understand why uh, James Fraser can't see what he can. But he can see something that Richard can't. Ah, oh, who knows? Perhaps it's your special eyes, Professor. Perhaps there's something all about you that no one knows. I'm certain we'll get to that at some point as well. And we have cleared a special spot at the final chair of our table, and that is for our next guest. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Bridget Jeffries, and I am, uh, I'm playing a character that you guys may or may not meet here in a few minutes. But more than anything, I'm just super honored and flattered to be with this top shelf freaking table and the amazing Old Ways podcast. Wonderful. And so we raise the curtain tonight on the aftermath of the Basilica. Now, the group themselves, they come back together, having seen some rather terrible things, both of them, and uh, were making their way back to the hotel in the under the cover of darkness. Yes? So, Mr. Fraser and the professor had seen strange things in the square although not the same thing (laughs) and the group coming out of the basilica had managed to not recover the thing that they were looking for and yet still find something they didn't know about and so where we will rejoin our story is with those groups coming together in the courtyard in the walkway between uh, the basilica and the walkway that leads towards the canal I am tightly clutching on to a piece of paper and not saying anything about it. Mr. Fraser, you would see Lady Elizabeth and uh, the rest of the group there coming out of the Basilica. Yes. Also a distinct lack of a leg. Not human, but like no statue leg. She's saying that there are six legs, not seven. Yes. So the last thing Mr. Fraser saw was as he and uh, Richard were hurrying down one of the side streets near the Basilica uh, to get away from this this figure that appeared uh, in the piazza was a a mist or a, a fog coalescing above them and quite near to them. So I think as he sees this and it dawns on him what it could potentially mean, Mr. Fraser grabs hold of Richard by the collar and physically drags him down the uh, down the cobbled street uh, as fast as they can go away from this thing. 
Okay. So the group of the Basilica probably sees two figures, uh, unaware that they're Mr. Fraser and the professor, but you see two figures almost cloaked in fog overhead, hustle out towards the canal. Come along, Mr. Courtney. We, we've, we've not a moment to lose. I know, the, the, the one with the gun, he... Yeah, quick, quick. Never mind, never mind that. It's it's whatever, whoever, I, I'm, this is uh, that, that concerns me more than your imaginary friends with come, guns. Just, just, just go, come on, let's, let's get on with it. There's no need to discuss it. Do we hear Mr. Fraser's Scottish baritone on the breeze? You probably do hear a non-Italian voice on the breeze, yes. It is easy to surmise that it may be him, given that your you knew that your compatriots would be out uh, there watching the outside to, to ensure nothing terrible happened to you. I think they're over that way. Should we signal for them, or we, we could rush after them? Uh, well... I'm not quite sure how much good signaling will do, since they seem to be talking, so perhaps we should just go after them. We're not burdened down with any unnecessary limbs, so... Litty, how about you two make it back to the hotel, and I'll I'll go ahead and retrieve the two of them. How about the three of you make spot-hidden rolls? Mm. Oh my. So, Professor, you and Mr. Fraser uh, get out onto the, the canal walkway. You clear the buildings and you're now but hop, skip, and a jump from the front door to the hotel when this happens. this mist still following us? It is not. Um, I think uh, as, as soon as um, he realizes that, that, that they're clear of the mist and it's, it doesn't seem to be chasing them down um, and he'll, he'll have been looking over his shoulder and back at it the, the whole way as they kind of scurry down the, the, uh, the alleyway um, He'll uh, bring Richard to to a stop, and if he can, um, and say, "I think, I think we've uh, we've got away from it." Yes, quite. They, they don't seem to be following us. I I, I think we're uh, yes, we're out of the woods. I, we, we should we should head back round to the back round to the basilica. The, the others might be in danger. Um, well, I don't know. Um, well, I do, man. Come on. Or, or do you want to go back to the hotel? If you want to go back to the hotel, go back to the hotel. But I'm heading back to the Basilica. Well, we, we could wait here. I mean, it's... um, we, we can see anything that's coming. How's that helping anyone? If they're in danger, if if, if, if you did see two gunmen in the square, as you, as you believe, then they're not here. They're not chasing us. Where have they gone? There were three of them. Only one of them had a gun. That's beside the point. Listen... Come with me or or don't come with me. I don't care. I'm going to the Basilica to make sure the others aren't in danger. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, the two of you stop there for the moment, have your discussion, turn around, and head back towards the Basilica. Yeah, we'll go a slightly different way, just just in case this, whatever it is, is, you know, we don't want to run straight back into it. So if we can kind of c- circle around a little bit and go down a different, different side street. Absolutely. So there is a path for you uh, to go back walk the length of the hotel and uh, which would be east and then head directly north down an alleyway and then back west pick your way through some of the buildings and enter behind the basilica in a different you have to do a bit of a little bit of walking around well we'll be i won't be walking if uh, the others are potentially uh, in, in danger from either three men one of whom has a gun uh, or whatever this other thing was um, certainly not be tarrying Certainly. Okay, so you've both picked up the pace then. So the three of you, as far as your spot hidden goes, Lady Elizabeth, you said 29, 26? 24, which is a hard success. Okay. Giles? 37 under 45, which is a regular success. Good. 95 over 41. Fantastic. How fitting. So the three of you are moving through the Piazza San Marco. And you've got the the marble all around. The night itself has cleared of clouds, mostly anyway. And you can see that in the upper balconies and and areas where these columns head up, there seems to be a rather low-lying fog. Um, you note it for a moment. 
Mr. Griffith, because it seems a little early for fog. You're not a, a local as far as the Venetians are concerned, but given the temperature, it seems a little strange. Uh, Lady Elizabeth, you seem to hone in on the fact that there's fog in the area and that it also seems to be there seems to be movement in it. Now, that's not completely uncommon given your time in London, uh, but this fog moves very fast. It almost swirls. Does it remind me of the fog in Paris at all? When we were in the basement? A little. There was fog there too. Hmm. Uh-oh. The person who doesn't really notice it at all, and the fact that it's begun to, at least portions of it have begun to move down uh, her back and legs, is Miss Bellinger. Um, it does feel a little cold for a second, Miss Bellinger, but it must be the proximity to the canals. It's all the water. And right now, you're not really thinking a ton about temperature, given the fact that you have a letter where you're supposed to have a leg. And so you continue to move through the square. Unless, of course, Lady Elizabeth, you're going to interdict in some fashion. I'm it, If Miss Bellinger is next to me, then I'm just going to stick out an arm and almost automatically to keep her from moving forward. Um, don't move. What is it? Do you see something, Lady Elizabeth? Do you not see the fog? Yes, there's fog all around. There's water. Where there's water, there's probably fog. It's reasonable. This isn't natural fog. What do you mean? I'm just sort of staring at it. Don't touch it. And where... Where are Richard and Mr. Fraser? Fog can play th tricks with your mind, Miss Maggie. We need to get back to the hotel. The fog in the trenches, you could hear things that weren't there. Maggie, you hear in your left ear, so close. It's the voice from Miss Cavallero's house. It sneaks its way into your spine. And you just hear Maggie say, I know I was so close. And now we have to keep looking for this thing. I need it. I, I know. You're a fairly perceptive person, Lady Elizabeth. It appears that Miss Bellinger is talking to herself. Miss Bellinger, who are you speaking to? Well, I think it's part of myself. Um, like how sometimes you talk to yourself, you have like a, a subconscious, you know, uh, the self-talk. No. I don't know. You've never thought things in your head? In that vast head of yours? I don't speak them to myself as if they were someone else, and I certainly don't answer myself. Miss Maggie, Lady E, could we not have a discussion in the middle of the plaza and get back to the hotel? You hear footsteps, the three of you. Hurried footsteps. I draw my knife. From behind us or in front of us? From behind you. The darkness of the basilica and the plaza square there. There's footsteps coming from around part of that building. There's more than one set, and they are in a hurry. I turn to see who it is. I turn around, lifting my cane. Mr. Fraser, you come upon this scene, cutting through this, this somewhat collected fog here. Your compatriots ready for something terrifying to happen. And the, is the, the fog kind of around them, yeah? Uh, yeah, a bit. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think uh, as he uh, approaches, um, or as they approach, I should say, um, he kind of stops short a little bit um, when he sees that the, the fog's there, and uh, and he just he, he calls out uh, almost sotto voce, but uh, you know, obviously loud enough that they they can hear him. Say, Lady Elizabeth, Simon, Miss, Miss Ballinger, Mister Fraser, you gave us quite a start. Come, come away, come come away, Your Ladyship. It's it's that. It's that mist, that fog again. Yes, I've, I'm quite aware. Thank you. But I'll move in that direction. Okay. The fog follows you. It's hard to tell, for most of you anyway, it's hard to tell whether or not it's purely an environmental effect based on the weather or whether it's something else. For most of you, of course. For you, Maggie, it no longer seems at all environmental. 
You have an understanding now with it, it seems. It wants something done. Luckily, your goals seem to align. You want to collect the pieces too. I don't think that um, the, the fog is going to hurt us, though. Oh. Oh, it will. I can quite assure you that fog threw me a, a halfway down a corridor. Are you sure you didn't trip? Miss Ballinger, I am quite sure I did not trip. I find the fog to be quite encouraging. I have seen tonight something inexplicable. And that fog is all part and parcel of it. Folk, everyone, can we just get back to the hotel and stop discussing things out in the open around a fog? You're nearly there. As you were walking, that Maggie probably would occasionally be putting her hand out and like running it through the fog and letting it drift over her fingers. It feels nice. Miss Bellinger, I said not to touch it. You don't know what it can do. I can, it's right here. It's not hurting me. Is it speaking to you, Miss Bellinger? Does fog speak to you? It did once. Oh. In Paris. Well, then it might be the fog, actually. You get to the door. Upon arrival at the hotel at this late hour, you are, if you're going to go through the front door, forced to ring a bell as the door is locked. Oh, I'm ringing that doorbell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Simon, Simon and, and James Fraser are probably at the same time of pushing their I, fingers I, I, into I'm the door. I'm kind of done with all this out here. There's just too much kerfuffle, and I'd like to get back inside with light. You see the fog head out into the canal, and it seems to float over the water, and join maybe some of the other and the darkness that's out there. And you see it wrap itself around the gondola, a few of them, before it heads out. What you imagine is into the, to the either either into the ocean or into the, the larger sea that uh, awaits. You see a, a young gentleman come to the door. He uh, unlocks the front door and then opens it. Uh, we we've no spare rooms. Oh, we have uh, we have rooms al already. Yeah. Oh, my apologies. It's quite late, though. He opens the door. Yes, we've be, we've been taking the air, hmm. seeing Venice by night. It's very beautiful. And, uh, if you'd be so kind, he helps you in. And then uh, after you are all in, he relocks the door. He says, "I apologize for the uh, the door lock. There, we've." Uh, just had some strange characters about, you know? Better safe than sorry. Strange characters, you say? What, what like uh, thieves, bugglers, that, that sort of thing, you mean? Well, we, we had a man in here earlier who tried to uh, tried to, to fetch off with the money behind the register. Oh. It's, uh, it's not common, but uh, it's happened once or twice in the past few years. The war here has done a fair number on some of us. He looks down at the ground. Aye, aye, well, uh, yes, I suppose. Uh, I trust the uh, the police have uh, apprehended the miscreants. As far as I am aware. Jolly good, jolly good. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. We shall uh, we shall be on our guard against that sort of thing. Here, have, have this for your trouble. Give him a, uh, a few coins. He takes them. And uh, you take the grand red carpeted staircase up. Even in the uh, limited light that the hotel at night offers, it is a very pretty lobby and hotel. Uh, you all find your rooms, unless you're planning on doing some more conferring. Richard will say um, at a convenient moment, um, Maggie, Maggie, did you, um, did you find the leg? No, we did not. It had already been taken and there was a letter left. A letter? Yes. What, what did it say? Someone had taken the leg. There was a there was a note that they they broke in and took it. Oh, what well, sort of like an IOU? They 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 left a note there to say they'd taken it. Were they going to return the, the leg? I I don't believe they were planning on returning it. It, it did seem rather. Here, I can show you the letter. Uh, y yes, I'm. Uh, very interesting. I, I'm I'm kind of glad that you you didn't find it. I'm 
I'm a little worried. I would like to clarify just for um, plot purposes. Is this a conversation that Maggie and Richard are having in one of their rooms or are you having it in the hallway outside your rooms? I think the hallway, just a sort of conversation in passing. And I've been informed that it's improper for us to be in each other's rooms. Uh, So I will show it to you, Richard. The letter is small, inside a small yellowing envelope. It's sealed with a, a wax seal. The letter is unsigned. Ah, well, I, um, I have no idea when this was written, but um, I don't know of anybody sealing letters with wax on a common basis these days. I, I wonder if this belongs to somebody. I wonder if we could maybe ask ask around about. Well, it happened during war times. Yes. Maybe somebody in the library would know. Um, there, there may be a, a register of um, seals. That would make sense. Possibly. So, or if we could find a, some sort of death records. It says that Marco had died. I suspect that might be a common name in Venice, but... Um, I mean, we don't appear to have an exact date. I, 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 I think if we... Um, yes, try and work out where the seal belongs... So the two of you have had this co- or having this conversation, um, given Simon's normal connection to or attachment therein to the professor, when he does lag behind with Maggie, are you slowing up or are you just going to your hotel room? Simon would pause by his door and look back at them and say, unless we are going to have a, a sit down and talk about what happened tonight, I think everybody should turn in. We'll have a discussion over breakfast. Yes, we'll be right along, Simon. All right. Professor? Uh, yes? W- with people in the hotel you know, who aren't supposed to be here, I'm going to be checking my my stuff, and I think you should check your uh, gear as well. All right? Yeah, yes, I, I will. Tonight. And Simon's going to go into his room and check his trunk. I'm going to make sure the trunk has not been opened and stuff missing. Oh, find it just as it is. Okay. Just as, just as you left it, the trunk is in fair working order and everything within therein is fine. Because Simon is also worried with, the, if nothing else, I, Simon knows Fitzgeorge was around here and he wouldn't put it past Fitzgeorge to have their rooms tossed while they were out. So uh, with that said, I'm so scared to ask. Is anyone doing anything before they they fall asleep? As we're um, heading to our respective rooms, um, I will try and catch uh, her ladyship's attention for a moment. Sure. If that seems to be possible, if she hasn't kind of gone, you know, focused single-mindedly to her room and closed the door behind her. Her ladyship is waiting for you, actually, further down the hall. All right. In in that case, um, James will head over to to where she's waiting, um, Ah, uh, your ladyship, if you don't mind me asking, did, did you say that when we were in the in the cellar, whatever you might call it, uh, in the, the hospital uh, outside Paris, uh, did you say that you thought you saw somebody? Yes, and heard, actually. Did this, this person happen to look like... Uh, and here, at this point, he will describe the person that he saw jump off the roof onto the uh, piazza. Yeah, the description, a French Revolution area aristocrat, is pretty close. Might be a little eerily close. That's very close, actually. I. How did you know? I think I saw him tonight in the piazza. In the fog? Ah, uh, well, the fog came after, but... He was standing on the rooftops, watching. I think he'd been watching us through the evening. Uh, and, and then, I, 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 I could hardly believe my own eyes, but he leapt from the rooftops and landed, uh, agile, graceful as a cat, on the piazza. And then he, he saw me. He looked at me. Right at me. Well, I rather imagine that what we've both seen is what our dear Mr. Griffith would call a haint. I, I, 
Aye, that's aye. That, that's what he called it, wasn't it? A hint. Uh, I don't know the, the word myself, but... A ghost, Mr. Fraser. A ghost, aye. No, aye, aye, a ghost. But what's he... Why? How? I, I don't understand. We're hundreds, hundreds of miles away. How is he here? Perhaps he was here in life, Mr. Fraser. If he's looking for this simulacrum, he was involved with it, we know that. Perhaps he was here in life, or perhaps ghosts don't work the same way we do, and they can just pop up somewhere. Aye, well, that, that would seem to be the way of it, aye, aye, but uh, is, he, is he following us, do you think? Entirely plausible, I suppose, but... I rather wonder if he's been speaking to Miss Bellinger. She was talking to the fog. That's not good. That's not good at all. No, no, it isn't. And she has, uh, well, she has two pieces of this this simulacrum now. Is uh, is she is she is she well? I I I, I know she was suffering some ill effects from from the from the arm. Miss Bellinger is quite resilient. Well, I hope so. I do. We also have other issues, Mr. Fraser, and I'm going to hand him the note that I found in the cathedral. So his jaw will drop as he sees the note. Aye. Aye, well, I knew he was here, but... You didn't see anyone enter the basilica after we did? Uh, no, not, not, not on our side, no. Uh, it's possible that there's some other entrance round, round, round the back or something that he knew of, but unless he was already there waiting for you. He knew we were there. I don't know why he didn't confront anyone, but he knew I was there. Not just us. Mm. He knew I was there. How did he know? Well, did, uh, did Miss Ballinger not say that she'd spoken to him? Perhaps he put two and two together and, and perhaps... Well, how would he know you're in the in the Basilica tonight? That is the question. I know that he knows I'm in Venice, but how did he know I was in the cathedral at that exact moment? It was not part of the original plan. No, no, un unless... You don't think he's mixed up in this whole simulacrum business as well, do you? Oh, I absolutely do. I no longer believe in coincidence, Mr. Fraser. Perhaps he followed down some leads. I mean, I have no idea how long he's been in Venice. Perhaps he he knew that the simulacrum was there and well, maybe he put two and two together and, and, and guessed that we'd be going looking for it. Maybe he was waiting for you. He put the note right in front of my hiding spot, Mr. Fraser. He knew I was there. Oh, dear... Going from bad to worse, I, I... Quite. I don't know how to deal with a ghost, that's for sure, but he's just a man. If he means you harm, if he's some way involved in this, then you don't need to worry about him. If it comes to it, I'll deal with him. I'm sure you will, Mr. Fraser. Perhaps we should retire and sleep on all of this. I don't exactly have the emotional capacity to process everything at the moment. Perhaps we'll have some more ideas come morning. Of course. Of course. A good night's sleep. Uh, that'll do us the power of good. All right, let, let's, let's speak again in the morning. Uh, is there anything you need before you retire? Just a good night's sleep. If you can ensure by any means that no ghosts or haints or goblins or demons or anything of the sort enters the hotel, I would be most grateful. She smiles slightly to let you know she's trying to lighten the mood. Uh, aye, well, I'll uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll sleep with one eye open, eh? <laughs> uh, just make sure you rest, Mr. Fraser. Good night. Yeah, of course, good night. It, it was fairly late when the group decided to break into the Basilica. And so I would imagine after the time spent inside and then spent outside, it's rather late when you get to bed. That said, though, sleep comes in turn for all of you, some easier than others. Those of you who are exhausted through any previous, we'll say, physical 
adventures you've had find sleep probably fairly quickly. Those of you who might be down on, say, magic points or luck or sanity probably take a little bit longer to get to sleep. But sure as the earth continues to turn, morning arrives. And so I should ask our guest how they'll make their arrival. Yes, so she is going to be making her arrival the moment there is a slither of sunrise on the horizon, which is probably going to be around that 4.45 a.m., 5 a.m. mark. Uh, She's going to make sure that she is in civilian uniform attire. Uh, She is going to have her badge in her hand, and she is going to very quickly, with a lot of urgency, slam into Simon Griffith's door. Um, She begins banging on the door uh, in rapid succession with a lot of urgency. And she desperately whispers through the door, Basilica Policia, Monsignor Simon Griffiths, please, please, you need to open the door. We don't have much time. She's out of breath. And then there's just like that thud sound of exasperation where she just throws her forehead into the door. And now she's just slapping at it, um, hoping that he'll open the door. Uh, Simon gets up. Uh, he, as a soldier, can snap awake and get. Uh, he goes to the door, pulls on a pair of pants with uh, suspenders, and wearing his underalls underneath. Oh, cracks open the door. Who are you? She looks up, and you see a uh, very petite African American woman with a pretty lousy. Italian accent, although the the language is more or less spot on. And she looks at you, she says, Simon? Simon Griffith? I'm so sorry, did I wake you? Of course I did. May I come in? We don't have much time. Um, yes, but first, if I may have your name and why you are here. I'd prefer not to discuss that in a hallway. There are ears. There are ears everywhere. You understand that, right? There was more than I just watching you tonight. I think your friends may be in grave danger. Come on in. Uh, but I'm being very careful looking for any sudden movements because I do not know this person. I close the door behind her. Oh, she slips into the room. No, I close the door behind you and I gesture to a chair for you. Um, she looks at you, close the door um, behind her, and she just gives you this, <sighs> this sigh of relief. And then almost as if like a light switch happened or a veil drop, the entire bullshit stops. And she turns and she goes and she jumps directly onto the center of your bed, uh, plopping her butt down, swinging her feet. And she goes, Simon, hi, how are you? Looks like you guys had a really rough night. You want to tell me about it? Well, we can start talking about it as soon as you answer my first question. Oh, yes, Mia Aspen. And you are from... Oh, well, recently I was in Cairo, but you and the antics of your little friends pretty much sent me a telegram saying, hey, please come immediately. Why haven't you checked in with Dr. Pierce recently? Well, after what happened, we have been keeping a low profile since, um, did you see the papers in Milan? Yeah, I was just going to say that didn't strike me as low profile. And she slides off the bed. And then violating all boundaries, she just starts, like, going through your room. Like, she looks underneath the bed. She's moving her way to the trunk with the very intention to open it up and start uh, flipping uh, through uh, it. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I saw the papers. Is the is the trunk off limits? My apologies. Uh, that's, that's where I keep my stuff. Oh, surely you don't have anything to hide from us, though. Right? You wouldn't have anything to hide from us. Right, Simon? Look, I have stuff to hide from everybody. You should know that by now. Mm, Even from me? And she's going to bat her eyes at you and those long eyelashes are going to flicker. Even from you? Very well. I have sisters. (laughs) And she moves, you know, directly next to the nightstand. She starts opening up drawers there. She'll leave the trunk alone, but she continues to work her way around the room. Okay, you were saying, yes, we all saw the newspapers in Milan. Uh, We would very much appreciate a better debriefing of what happened there. That sounded like a mess. <laughs> well, um, what do you know about Milan? And I'll fill in your holes. How's that? Tell you what, tell me everything you know about Milan and I'll fill in the holes myself. 
again, I don't have any proof of you, who you are. Oh. So I'm not going to spill anything. Let's just start talking. Maybe we should do this. We can have breakfast brought up and maybe I can put on a shirt. Oh, uh, you can put one on now. It's not bothering me. I was actually thinking about sleeping on the floor here for the next couple of days. Um, I don't know what's going on with your little coterie, but it looks like looks like you guys are having a hard time of it. You didn't get the leg. At least that's what I heard in the hallway. Really, you should tell your comrades not to have like really private discussions in a hallway because people can hear you. You're telling me. Do you have that note, by the way? I would love to read that note. It's not my note. Well, breakfast, you said, right? Yep. And she moves over to the bed and she pulls a pillow off and she throws it right on the floor and she takes the top cover. She throws that on the floor. Do we have phones in our room, Mike? Um, you could go out into the hallway and there is a service bell there you could ring for a member of staff. I will do that, though I will make sure when I come back in that she is not touching the trunk. You ring the service bell. You wait a little while, given the time of day. A couple minutes pass. By this time, likely your guest has made themselves very comfortable. Mm -hmm. She's on the floor, on her back, knees up, and she's scribbling something into a journal. Wide awake. I mean, this is like the best part of the morning for her. You see down the hallway, a member of staff begin walking up towards you. Monsieur, he stops at your door. Could I have breakfast brought up to the room here? Certainly. Mia, would do you like coffee? I'll have whatever you're having, husband. Comes a voice from on the other side of the bed on the floor. You see the staff member just slightly glance in. I will have a, a pot of coffee and some croissants. Some bread? Muffins? Certainly. We won't keep you and your wife waiting. He turns around. Thank you, sir. So after a few minutes, breakfast comes back up. But in the interim, please continue. All right, Mia. Who are you working for? You apparently know who the major is, but who are you working for? You sound like you're American. I am American, yes. Just the... Opportunities abroad are much more fitting for a, well, a woman of both my intelligence and ethnicity. So uh, I think I've already disclosed that I work for Dr. Pierce. Yeah, your employer, the one who is actually financing your little expedition on this trip. Yeah? Well, through the State Department, but yes. That's who I work for. He sent me here personally because you have been far too quiet. Your friends have been far too messy, and there is a great deal on the line. Are you going to eat that? She's like reaching into something that's clearly on your plate. I'm not stopping her. I mean, nor, nor could you. Uh, again, as Simon said before, he has sisters, so. So, are you gonna tell me what happened at the uh, at the Opera House? Because we're getting different reports that were included in the paper, naturally, but I would like to at least find uh, your debriefing since you're not checking in anymore. Well, first of all, it's not a matter of not checking in. It's a matter of leaving Milan quietly. Do you understand that? I'm sorry. Are you considering your departure from Milan quiet? <laughs> Let me get the rest of that. I I'm saying once we left the city, yes. So what do you know about what happened in Milan? Well, I know what happened in the paper. Uh, rumor mill is spilling that something else much more grisly happened. True or false? true. And the extent of your involvement? Well, I was knee-deep in it. Uh, let me let me elaborate a little for you. Please. Since you mentioned the leg already, I assume you know some of what's going on with this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is of great interest to our organization. You know that, Simon. We can't let this item fall into the wrong hands. Mm-hmm. And you were aware there was an item in Milan? Yes, very much so. All right, especially since you're my wife now, apparently. How long are you going to be sticking around with us? Uh, pretty much until I'm satisfied that you all have this situation in control. So I'm here to help, honey. Uh, Milan was a shit show. What I can tell you about it right now, until more details occur, is that someone had the atom and was using it we believe in an effort to more of us kill everyone in the theater. <clears throat> and she's choking on uh, that croissant. I mean, I, I can't confirm it, but why else would you stick it in the actual production like that? There was 
Do you believe? I don't. In things beyond your ken? Where are you from in America? Ugh, it's so boring. Ohio? Ohio. All right. So you do not believe in things beyond our understanding? No, that's a lie. I do. I've seen things. Such as? Well, that's a boring conversation for a different day. Maybe the next time I come and check up on you and your friends leaving messes all over Europe, I'll tell you that story. Mm. I'll hold you to that. Ooh. And she gives you the, I'm just a pool of water, blinky eyes, and then starts taking more food off your plate. This little woman can put away some food, honey. That's fine. Well, there seems to be... I put this. There is dark shit going on here. There has been some kind of summoning circle on a ferry, which I did tell the major about with the monster. You you rem- you were told about that, right? She kind of gives you a blank face. I-, I was in Cairo. I just things were moving very quickly. So so there's there's magic. There's this occult shit that's happening. You know how the occult was on the rise. 30 some years ago and people still have their little seances and all that other crap in the little organizations Mm -hmm. order of the golden dawn and garbage like that now the situation here is some of this shit's real and I didn't know that I mean my granny told me stories and so I know that ghosts are probably real I mean uh, my granny don't lie and I know that there's curses because again, if your if your granny lays a curse on someone, or there's witches and stuff like that, you, that's that stuff's true. You believe in it, it's true. And I I heard things in the battlefield that didn't make sense to me. Didn't see them, but I heard them, and that was enough for me. Hmm. Sometimes you got to be a bigger monster than the things you hear to get through it. So the situation is thing on the ferry there was a thing in Milan and this thing was in the opera house do you know what the devil is supposed to look like well as a historian there's a few different depictions how about eight feet tall with wings scaly is that what you saw that's what I killed with with the help of Mr. Fraser you okay oh well I'm healing the thing had acid for blood and this thing was living in the skin of a person and that's what I'm trying to tell you is when you run into shit like this shit goes sideways fast so we got the item we dealt with that and we buggered out of Milan as fast as we could is that is that succinct It's a very thorough debriefing. Thank you. She's slowing down with her eating as she's giving you this deference and this room to kind of, you know, breathe into your experience. And with what happened at the theater, we've been trying to keep a low profile since. Obviously, we weren't able to keep one in Moloch, but we're trying to be more careful here. So we've only been here two whole days. This is the third. So we haven't had a chance to cause any problems yet. The look she gives you, she was giving you just deference and space, but the look she gives you is very steely. eye. like, really? That's a lie you're going to spread across this floor today at me? That's fine. I'm trying to keep people in line, but there's only one of me and four of them. Yeah, I understand. How how are your little friends, by the way? (sighs) Mr. Fraser is quite competent. Yeah, I've seen... Very skilled. Mm. Usually uh, has his head screwed on tight. And uh, he can be relied on. Is he in love with the ladyship? I've been wondering that. Yeah, this is not something I speak of. Oh, It's not my on. business. It is it's not my... It is husband not... Husband and wife talk. I'm just curious. It won't go into the formal report. I do not know. This is not something I am interested in. It's I am... fine. You keep your secrets in your trunk. It's fine. Well, you could always talk to them. Oh, I plan to. We're going to have breakfast together, right, again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay, apologies. I interrupted you. Fraser, confident, no, but no. you won't answer whether or not he's in love with the ladyship. Got it. No, Keep going, please. You're, you're my wife. You're allowed to interrupt me. So, um... Oh. 
You fall into character so fast. Now, um, Lady E is Vesmont. Mm-hmm. She has the book learning. She's got the knowledge and skills and definitely believes in all this weird shit. The hmm. dark shit. Um, so she's uh, the person we lean on for that. And her pockets. No, 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 no. That's the professor. He's he's Professor Moneybags. Mm, this is Courtney, correct? Yeah, yeah, he's pretty much my job right now has been shepherding him across the the continent to make sure we can get the mission achieved. He's got the device that allows him to do this. Yeah, we're aware. We're also concerned that he has the device that allows him to do this. Well, it's bonded to him, more or less. Do you know where Dr. Julius is? At the moment? Can you put the major on that? Because the professor's been trying to get a hold of Dr. Julius for a while, and that could be useful. Look at you, already calling in favors. We've only been married a day. It's not calling in favors. It's you apparently are quizzing me on all this stuff, and you apparently are working for the same organization. So I'm trying to get my my co-worker here to do some work. It's it's fine, Simon. I'm just giving you a hard time. That's fine. Last question I do have. Well, no, actually, talk to me about Maggie. Well, Miss Maggie's a pistol. Hmm. How so? She's uh, an unstoppable force. Uh, she is fierce. She definitely leaps before she looks. Hmm. I heard her aunt was the same way. Interesting. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Professor... Uh- you hear voices in the room beside you. You've been hearing them now for a couple of minutes, and you've been tossing and turning in bed, hoping it's just some funny dream, but you can't help but wake up because of it. What do the voices sound like? Do they sound, I don't know, calm or angry? You hear Simon's tone and his gait, but it's also been beset by a woman's voice. They're coming from the same room. And it, that's definitely not Maggie. Nor is it Lady Elizabeth. I think Richard will um, dress slightly and uh, head into the corridor and maybe um, put an ear to the door. Certainly. Go ahead and give me a listen roll. 27, which is... Ooh, yeah, that's a success. Good. Okay, continue the conversation. So, just from a efficacy standpoint here, uh, has Lady Elizabeth been distracted with her whole little London scandal going on? Or is her head mostly still in the game? Not for me to say. You'd have to talk to her. Now, I have a question for you. Simon. How did you know that we didn't get the leg last night? Besides listening in. Oh, well, you got here two days ago. Uh, I got here three, so I've been watching you. And then, plus, your friends are really loud that they are. I mean, Lady E is not loud. But you put the professor and Miss Maggie in the same room and I'm afraid it's, uh, it's hard to turn them off. You put the liability and the firecracker in the same room? Whose idea was that? Simon, come on, you've got to play the game better than this, darling. It's theirs. They apparently have a thing for each other. You were asking about Lady <sighs> E and... And Jim there, well, I can confirm that Maggie and the professor are uh, definitely drawn towards each other. Well, whether this is for good or for mischief, I couldn't tell you. Well, I won't criticize your babysitting skills anymore today, at least. They are adults, Mia. And the state of the world is in your hands right now. You do understand that that's not an apples to apples comparison. I understand, but do you hurt cats? (laughs) No, no, I don't. You want to try hurting those two? No, but I'm totally putting that quote in the official report back to Dr. Uh, Pierce. That's fine. The major will understand. These are not soldiers. They do not follow orders. In fact, Ms. Maggie would not follow an order if you gave her one. You have to make it seem like it's her idea if you ever want to get anything done. Oh, I haven't given you enough credit. You are good at this babysitting thing. Pick your battles. <laughs> so the thing here is, you've been here three days. What have you seen? What do you know of what's going on? Well, in transparency, 
Mr. Griffith. Um, that question you asked me a bit ago about have I seen things that are not tied to our common understanding? And I told you truthfully, yes. Those things for me come out at night. So I have a rather difficult time moving about during the day, which is why I start my mornings as early as possible. And I retire shortly before the sun sets. So my daytime investigations have been more or less just stalking you all. Okay. I did make it out for just a moment last night, though. Looks like that was a fun romp. What did you see last night? It's kind of hard to describe what I saw last night. Please try, because I was in the Basilica. Oh, and then to save time, I will just recap what she saw with fog and running around and two people left, two people came back. Mike, I understand what Bridget's telling me, but Bridget see any of the things that the professor or Jim saw or or she just saw Jim and the professor running around so to play Switzerland here I'm going to tell you to refer to what she told you she saw the the group running around now that's unlike Jim he's supposed to be the one who was watching the dog keeping an eye on things but that also proves the point the professor should not be left alone Uh, Or betting with the firecracker. Not to reiterate that previous statement, but just to reiterate that previous statement. Just don't turn your back on him. He turns on his device and he gets swallowed through a hole in space and time. Do you want me to talk to the Major? Do you want me to send him a telegram? The problem with the telegram is, you know, there will be a paper copy. Someone also reads that. The problem with calling is it's going to be hooked up through all the different systems across Europe. People can listen in. Does he want me to send him letters? What does he want? Does he want telegrams and code? You you need to tell me these things, because when I'm trying to keep a low profile after we destroy an opera house, I I don't want to let people know where we all are. Uh, And she's sucking, like, some type of jam or cream cheese or something off of her fingers, and she goes, don't worry, I'll get you. I'll get your communication protocols all ironed out. But you need to use them, That's fine, Simon. You can't go silent for this long. That makes them get worried. And when they get worried, they send people out like me. And I'm one of the sweeter people that they could send out. Don't let them send one of the other agents out. Okay? Oh, yeah. I've met them before. I was one of them. Now, shall we? Do you want to meet the rest of them? Wife? I'd be delighted. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to go open the door and the professor would have the forewarning, right? He would have all of the speech and sound that he's been able to overhear. So my question would be to him is, are you using the uh, element of foreknowledge to gain a a hasty retreat? Very much so. So Richard is not going to go for a confrontation here. Very well. Uh, Then I think given the timing, I think it's reasonable that you'd be able to get back into your room. You do have the room right next door. And so I will give uh, both Simon and Mia hard listen rolls to see if they hear a door shut. That'll be a fail. Failed also on Mia. Okay. Professor, you get back into your room and you silently shut the door, you think. And hopefully no one noticed. Uh, So Simon and uh, and your wife, Mia, where are you two stopping first? Who are you waking up at um, just about quarter past five? These poor babies have had no sleep. God bless them. I'm going to wake up the only person who deserves to be woken up. Jim. Okay. Because he's the responsible one out of all of them. Very well. You go to Mr. Fraser's door. And I knock on it. Amongst the dream world that you were spending your time in, Mr. Fraser, there comes a rather sharp rap. It's against reality itself. It forces you back into a conscious state at far too early an hour. Your body already needfully reminding you. I'll um, reach out, blearily look at the pocket watch on my bedside table to see what time it is. You don't believe it. You don't believe it's that time. Oh, just, just leave it outside the door, please. And try and go back to sleep. You hear from within, Simon, some call from Fraser, but um, 
He doesn't seem a very awake one. All right, Miss Mia, are you wide awake? Or do you want to take a quick cat nap? Oh, no, I'm wide awake. Like I say, I start my mornings early. How about we go down? Is there a restaurant in this hotel? There is. Let's go down and get some fresh fruit and stuff, and uh, we'll give them a couple hours. How's that sound? They're not on the same time frame you are. She's going to look at the watch on her arm. Sure, I mean, what's a couple hours when, like, you know, the fascist commune could be taking over the world? Yeah, breakfast, fruit, let's do it. Understand, I'm working with the department, but they're not. So let's give them the benefit here. Okay, so the two of you are going to go downstairs and you're going to get some fruit. (laughs) We're going to get third breakfast. You get the morning paper. Uh, It would Mm -hmm. be available to you. The news report from Venice here, which is in a couple of different languages, but the English sheet that you are both able to read relatively freely, you notice that uh, there's a report that a man was ripped apart last night. And it seems to be a uh, gondola worker. It says... They are going to be uh, continuing to work to find the rest of him. Hmm. It's a very disturbing story, and it seems like a whole lot of people who are up early here in the hotel are reading it, and they look very concerned. I wonder if this is the one who was uh, taking us around yesterday. An hour or so passes, and Mr. Fraser, you do finally wake back up. Yes, half past six is the, the, the time that he would be waking anyway. Um, yeah. And uh, get up, uh, get dressed, wash his face, comb his hair, um, and uh, cross the corridor and very quietly tap on um, a ladyship's door. And if he receives no response, um, he will go downstairs and um, start dealing with uh, breakfast. But uh, I don't know. I don't know whether he'll get a response. Yes. Lady Elizabeth? You hear her very groggy. It's not morning yet. Very good, your ladyship. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back in in an hour. Um, and he'll toddle off uh, down the stairs in order to uh, get the morning papers, uh, have some breakfast himself, and prepare a... Uh, well, arrange for a tray of breakfast to be prepared for uh, her ladyship. You go downstairs to get uh, morning tea and some things for yourself. And uh, you can't help but notice that Simon is already up and he's at a table with a young lady. So I think um, he'll, he'll go and get the paper. I'm, I'm assuming that the uh, that the hotel has uh, um, has a rack of newspapers in the, Certainly. In, uh, the lobby or something like that. Um, so he'll he'll walk over towards the uh, the table. Uh, good morning, Mister Griffith. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Miss. Good morning, Mister Fraser. Will you be joining us? Terribly sorry. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. No, you haven't. Sit down. And then you will have the pleasure. Fraser looks very bem- bemused and confused by the, <laughs> the whole situation. Um, it, wow. It's it's all right, Jim. I think she's on the up and up. I mean, I'll check her bona fides later, but the information she's dropped seems to support the fact that she works for the same organization I do. So I'd like you to meet my wife, Mia. Oh, I see. Uh, pleasure to meet you, uh, Mrs. Griffith. It is a pleasure. Uh, I'll just get myself a wee cup of tea and I'll, uh, I'll come and join you. Fantastic. Are the rest of your sleepyhead friends coming down anytime soon? Oh, well, I mean, it's a little early yet. I wouldn't imagine so. Ooh, we're losing so much time, but that's fine. You know, rest is important. <clears throat> Very well, hi. To walk off in a state of utter amusement and confusion by who this strange woman with her peculiar manner of speaking is. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you go, go and get yourself a cup of tea. So, Maggie, the morning arrives a little earlier than you had expected, and that is because you are already at the wash basin in your room continuing to we'll say work out the additional um, well friends you seem to have collected in your lungs overnight it is a process you are learning Mm -hmm. you are learning how strong your ab muscles are and how how much you can force air out of your chest to remove said phlegm and there's three or four times as many as there was yesterday so there's more 
moving chunks. Oh time. yeah. I will uh, collect them once again and probably take them to Paul this morning. Perhaps he could give me something so mm -hmm. I can make it through the day. Indeed. And uh, for Professor, for your part, having heard them leave the space, would you continue to get all the way dressed or would you go back to bed? I think Richard will get back to bed at this current moment in time. He's pretty exhausted. Fair enough. Um, so, Maggie, you deliver your phlegm friends to Paul. Mm -hmm. He wakes up and puts on as much of a scientific face as he can, and he's eagerly poking and prodding them. They seem to have multiplied uh, between last night and this night. We shall have to get something to uh, continue to clear your air passages. Um, I have just the thing. It may make you a little hyper, though. Oh, oh okay, but it will it will clear up my lungs? works on everything else. I don't see why it wouldn't. Oh, a wonder drug. Well, not so much, but um, something that we use for those uh, war victims, especially who've uh, inhaled gases. Oh, well, I'm I'm willing to try anything. I, I would rather not like to do this again tomorrow morning. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry you're going through this. He mixes you up a... Um, a rather cloudy white tonic. I don't know. Bottoms up. <laughs> Maggie just downs it. Good. Now, straight away, get something to eat. You'll want it quick because the stomach uh, lining can be upset by it. Yes, of course. And thank you, Paul. Let, let me know if you find anything out about that stuff. He kind of looks at the dish that it's in. I'll, uh, I'll do my best. He shuts the door. May you will head down to get breakfast. Very good. In so much you run into first, Mr. Fraser, who is uh, working to get, it looks like a breakfast of his own settled before, uh, perhaps read the paper a bit before he's, he's making his way. You think probably back up at some point for Lady Elizabeth. Oh, Mr. Fraser, good morning. Oh, good morning, Miss Ballangella. Did you get for uh, some tea? Oh, uh, of course. Oh, splendid. Yeah. You're uh, up bright and early this morning? Uh, yes, I, I woke up not feeling well, but I've oh. already checked in with Paul. Oh, oh good. I'm, I'm glad to glad to hear it. Uh, I hope he's uh, managed to uh, to help a little. He gave me a drink and then advised that I get something to eat, so... Oh, a very, very sound proposition. Uh, is it the, um, the item causing you uh, discomfort? Oh, uh, I don't, I don't know specifically, but that is a possibility. It's I've been coughing things up. Oh, oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you don't have a, some sort of chest infection. Well, that 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 might be it. traveling. It's very hard on the body at times, and changes in in temperature and air pressure. And... Hmm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, obviously, I'm not a medical man myself, so uh, I don't know. Uh, don't know to these things, but um, I don't know if you've noticed, but. Uh, Mr. Griffith uh, has uh, already uh, begun his breakfast, and he seems to have a companion with him. He, he does. Yes, uh, um, uh, uh, well, a young for lady. Him. Well, um, and uh, he kind of glances left and right. <laughs> I, I think maybe if if he can stay busy with that, he'll he'll maybe you know lay off of us a little bit. Ah, uh, uh, well, ah, uh, no, uh, I'm. I'm rather afraid that it, the reverse might be the case. Um, oh. Apparently, um, he has told me that uh, I believe he, he knows this uh, young lady and uh, she is in the same employment as he is himself. Oh, there's two of them now. She is uh, his wife, he tells me. Oh, understandable. Yes. Um, yes, uh, she's a... Uh, uh, Oh, she seems a personable enough young lady. Well, I should go make her acquaintance. I, I will. Um, I'll bring your tea over. Oh, thank you. I'll walk over to Simon and Mia. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Miss Maggie. I see you have a friend with you this morning. I do. Or, oh, oh should I, uh, your wife, I right hear. Yes, I was it was a whirlwind engagement. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. 
I'm Maggie Bellinger. Uh, she stands up and extends you a hand. Miss Bellinger, it's a pleasure to meet you. You as you as well. Uh, you must uh, tell tell me about yourself. Oh, there's just so much to tell in so little time. Um, please have a seat. Oh, okay. You will be joining us, won't you? Uh, of course. Do you know when your friends will be coming downstairs? You didn't happen to knock on their doors on the way by, did you? I did not. I have no idea. I stopped and talked to Paul. Uh, he's our he's our medical professional that is traveling with us. And then I uh, came right down because he gave me a drink and then told me to I should probably get something to eat because my stomach was going to be upset. And then I came right down. Also, oh. do I know what Paul gave me? Yes, you are suddenly all of a sudden feeling very energetic. My apologies that you aren't feeling well. Um, hopefully it passes soon. Is your bedmate awake yet? My bedmate? I don't have anyone in my room. That's silly. <laughs> and she throws like a confused look over to Simon. Didn't she have a bedmate? Isn't she sleeping with Courtney? Sleeping with Richard? I certainly have not done that yet. Oh. I have not said anything about that. Mia is jumping ahead of herself here. Well, she did say yet, so she's aiming for... So your future bedmate, is is he awake yet? Should we go wake him? You never know where the Orient Express will take you. Well, actually, arguably, I, I do kind of know where it's... But that's a, that's a different story for a that's different not, day. That's neither here nor there. No, I don't... I, I honestly do not know if they are awake or not. Hmm, disappointing. All I know is I am awake, very awake. I feel very invigorated this morning, and I would love to continue with our work from last night, Mr. Griffith. Oh, I have a letter, Mr. Griffith. That I don't think... Did I show you the letter last night? No, uh, I'm not aware of it. Oh, here, you should look at it. All right. I'll show him the letter. Mia's leaning over, and she's like peeling the back of an orange off. All right, Mia, by the Mm -hmm. way, did Pierce give you anything from me? No. (sighs) Honey, communication is a two-way streak. In order to get things, you actually have to reach out to us so we're aware that you need things. But since you stopped communicating with us, it's kind of hard to get you what you need. You know what I mean? He is like that, isn't he? Take, take, take. (laughs) Mia thinks that's absolutely hilarious, and this growing energy from Maggie is making her more and more excited. (laughs) I told you she was a pistol. Oh, I think you underestimated that term, though. I love her. Again, talking like you're not at the table. I think probably at at this point, Mr. Fraser will come back over with a a pot of tea and a couple of uh, cups. Um, and a, a plate with some um, little buns filled with cream as well. So I, uh, I uh, took the liberty of, uh, I believe they're called um, uh, maritoso. Uh, I understand they're a, a, something of a, a, a breakfast dish here in, in Italy. That's, that's what I've been told anyway. Uh, um, if you'd like to make a little space um, on the table, please, I'll put the tray down. So I'd... Uh... Appears from your letter here, Miss Maggie. Yes. That the uh, item was incorporated into a piece of sculpture. Yes. Within the, I did read it as well. Within the last mm, ten years, give or take. Well, you've already come up with something that me and Richard did not. Because of the uh, time frame. Because of the wall. So, what is it you have there? Uh, would you care for some tea, Mrs. Griffith? Yes, please, darling. And by the way, these little, and she mispronounces whatever the, the breakfast things you just put on the table is as she's shoving like two of those in her mouth at a time. <laughs> There's nothing delicate or ladylike about how she's eating. She's having a good time. Uh, I'll be mother, shall I? And they'll start pouring tea for people. <laughs> so what actually is the game plan today for you guys when your friends get up? Oh, we don't know yet. We were waiting for them to come down. And then usually how this works is in the morning we have breakfast together and then we all talk about what happened the night before and then maybe what we do what to do that day and then we split up and go our separate rays or we go together sometimes and then we do the same thing every day. It's breakfast, it's making a plan, it's going to investigate things and then it's breakfast the next day. Actually, I can go get Richard. Mia? Lady E comes walking in at this point. Mia, cats. <laughs> Maggie passes you, Lady Elizabeth, like a sh- shot of a cannon. Have you left the letter at the table, Maggie? I understand she did because yes. she handed it to me to read, so. 
I just sort of look at Maggie bolting past. At least someone has some energy this morning. Hmm. And I start walking in, pause, look at the new person at the table, raise one eyebrow, and just keep walking to the table. Mr. Fraser immediately gets to his feet um, when he sees Lady Elizabeth uh, approaching and uh, pulls back a chair for her. Uh, Your ladyship, uh, I do apologise. I wasn't expecting you up so early. Yes, well, someone did come knocking at my door about 20 minutes ago, and I just couldn't fall back asleep, so... Uh, Would you care for some tea and uh, one of these uh, rather delightful uh, uh, maritoso? That would be lovely. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Um, And you are... Wow. So, like, I've seen your photo in your file, and I've seen, I've seen, obviously, you know, like, professional shots in the newspaper, but they are a pure understatement for how beautiful you actually are. Hi! Good morning! Welcome awake. Oh, I'm Mia, Simon's wife. Oh, indeed. Mr. Griffith, you didn't tell us that you had a life companion? A pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Griffith. It is a pleasure. Um, How do you prefer to be called? Is it Lady... Would you prefer Lady E? I've heard multiple things. Lady Fitzroy? Lady Elizabeth, to you, thank you. Fantastic. Richard, there's a furious knocking at your door. Richard? Uh, are you uh, awake yeah. in there? Oh, I'm... Um, well, uh, are you decent? Uh, I'm, well... Is the door unlocked? Yeah. Maggie walks in. Ah, uh, Maggie... How are you this morning? I'm doing well. How are you, Richard? I'm uh, I'm I'm just a little tired from uh, my uh, my adventures. Um, oh well, perhaps you should lay back down. Um, yes, that's. Uh, are you sore? I could rub your shoulders for you, or. Um, I uh, I I, I, I I'm okay, thank you. Um, I uh, uh well, uh, let, let me let me get my dressing gown. I, I'm I'm um. Uh, are you okay? Well, there's no need for that. I I would like to take another look at your chest, if I may. I, um, I'm feeling quite well. well. Well, yes, of course. Maggie has put herself between Richard and the door. <laughs> <laughs> Much as one does. Certainly. If you don't mind. Um, well, no. Um, let, let, let me get my guide. Um, uh, it would be, uh, yes, the, the, the proper thing to do. Maggie does not turn away. Uh, Richard will just take whatever big coverings on the bed and sort of... Um, with one swift move, get out of bed whilst keeping the bed covering. Yeah, that's a, that's a dex roll, sir. Richard's dexterity is yeah, not not great to be honest. This any anything could happen. Oh no! So Richard has a dex of fifty. I believe a ninety nine is a fumble. Yeah. No, it's technically not a fumble, but it is a failure. You get out of bed with the full intention of the sheet covering you, so that way you can properly get dressed hmm. and. Unfortunately, it's completely attached to one end of the bed and you tip ass over tea kettle onto the floor Uh, with it somewhat in a very ecclesiastical sense, covering certain parts of you in uh, other sense, it not covering you at all. Uh, So there for you, Miss Bellinger, splayed out on the floor of the hotel room is the, um, well, the upper, the mostly upper form of Professor Courtney. And you now realize exactly how far the lines go. Sunburst pattern in some regard. Maggie will rush over to help Richard up. Uh, um, thank you. I am not quite myself. Maggie will trip on the blanket. Oh, oh hmm. my gosh, I seem to have fallen as well, uh, Richard. Are you okay? Oh, yes, it's just I was, I was looking at your, your chest and I couldn't... Oh, I, I, I must have fallen over this darn sheet. We should get rid of it. Well, um... Well, uh, yes, let, let me get my gown, and uh, that's what comes of um, sleeping on a broken bed. Well, I did tell you, I have a perfectly good bed that is not broken at all, and you would be more than welcome to come sleep in it if you'd like. Uh, perhaps I should have taken you up on that offer, but... Um, There's still time. Yes, yes, um, you... Yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, let, let me go and, um, <laughs> let, let me get my gown, um... Uh, c- c- shall we? Should we order some tea? He says nervously. I su- I suppose we could, and just stay here and chat. How was your night last night? Well, um, did you hear anything? Just now. Uh, no, last night. 
I heard lots of things. Maggie's slowly getting closer to wherever Richard's at. Well, um, it was most, um, Richard's moving away slowly, uh, but not obviously. Um, it, it was very strange. I, I heard, um, well, Simon, he, he appeared to have someone with him. Oh? Yes, I... Someone I... close to him? Maybe he takes a larger step. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you mean close. I mean, I, I think, um... She was perhaps his superior, maybe. Um, he he oh. appeared to be, um, uh, what's the word? A, de- a debriefing, I, I believe. Richard, do you like it when a woman's in charge? Um, well, I mean, uh, there are uh, uh, senior professors at the university, and they're, they're very nice people, yes. Do you find it invigorating? In- invigorating? Well, I, I mean, oh, uh, well, El- Elspeth gives a... a- uh, 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 an exceptional um, debate, indeed. Yes, she's um, yes, yes, very, very challenging. Oh, so you like a woman with with smarts? Well, uh, absolutely. Because I do know some French. Um. Well, yes. Um. Uh, but anyway, back 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 to the point. I, I'm I'm not sure who she was. She he he was telling her all kinds of things. Um, referred to you as a firecracker. I could see how that would be true. And and me as a liability. I could also see how that would be true. Well, I... I, I n- never considered myself as such, but, um... Yeah, maybe. And he was, um... I, uh... Well, Richard, can't you see it? You're always fiddling with that device, your fingers wrapped around it so delicately. As you move the lenses into place. Yes, I... Well, I'd be lying if I was saying I was in control last time. I I certainly wasn't. That's okay. I can be in control for you, Richard. It's something else. Um, well, I... I, I don't know if you remember. We, we did talk that perhaps you should try it sometime. I do remember that conversation. Is now a good time? I, I think it's as good a time as any. Maggie will turn so her back is to Richard, and she'll say, Perhaps you could show me how it's done, Richard. Well, absolutely. So Richard will, um, will go over to wherever his uh, suit jacket is. It'll still be in the pocket. Pull out the device. And I think Richard's mischievous. I think he's going to pick some lenses he's never used before. I think Richard will be picking uh, the clear cracked one and the mm-hmm. black one. Look, if you turn around, I'll um, I'll lower it onto your your face, and uh, I, I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, it it'll it, it it's not painful. It'll attach, and and ah, uh, well, some of the sensations are absolutely fantastic. Um, out of this world. I mean, I, if you've, I, I well, I, I, I you you will have to experience. It. I cannot describe it. I'll let. Richard lower the device, and as he does, I'll kind of put my hands up so my hands are like on holding his hands. Right. Um. How is that? Does that um? Is anything happening? You lower the device onto her face. The device does what it is meant to do. Additional lenses slowly and inexorably click into place around uh, your face and your cheeks. They staple the device to your face and you hear a bunch of clicking for a second and now I'd like you to make me a power roll can do 72 under 75 hmm alright so roll a d6 please that would be a 1 okay so you deduct a single point of magic everything in front of you goes black it comes back up a moment later very devoid of color, high contrast, almost negative space around you. Just moving your head left to right, you start to see swimming sensation. It's almost as if there is a miasma, some sort of cloud surrounding you. And you see it walk out of the room and you turn and that's when you come face to face with Richard. And his form is not shadowy and black. He is splayed with color. 
from his eyes and his chest, and you see it radiating out. It's at that point that you realize you're seeing something far beyond human vision should, and your heart rate picks up, and you begin to feel this flood of panic hit you, and you try to take the device off. You try to grab at it because you don't want to see it anymore. You don't want to see him in this way. You don't want to see the room in this way. You don't want to see or hear all the things you're beginning to pick up on the extent of your perceptions. The device doesn't come off. And I'm going to play an empowered Anna fate against you, Miss Bellinger. It doesn't come off. You can't seem to get it off. And you can feel that someone is trying to help you take it off. But they can't seem to get control of it either. And you scream and cry. But your your voice here in this land, wherever it is that you are, it doesn't pierce the veil. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. Everyone downstairs hears a woman scream at the top of their lungs. Now James, after glancing around for a moment, will leap to his feet, especially if he recognizes the, uh, the, the timbre of the, the voice, and just run. You're going to make me a, a sanity roll, Miss Bellinger, and I will be upgrading the sanity die for you. It was a 97 over 58. That's a big fail. No. This is not the one way Maggie planned. All right. So your current sanity is? Uh, 46. No, my current is 58. Current is 58. Very good. I take eight points of sanity from you. God. Oh. Now you will make me an intelligence roll. A hard success. For your intelligence roll? Yeah, it was 18 under 70. Uh, unfortunately for you, in the in the echoes of your own screams, your brain doesn't fight it off as a offshoot of the medication that Paul gives you. Uh, you come completely clean and clear of any of the um, effects of the medicine Paul gave you, and you stand before yourself in your own mental reality. And you come to grips with the fact that you might not be coming home. Uh, Maggie, are, are you okay? Let, let me let me try and get this off. Does Richard's voice pierce the veil at all? It does, actually. His voice does seem to pierce this veil. It's a little watery. It's almost as if he's talking to you while you're underwater. Like you'd had your head in a bathtub. Those of you who had run upstairs arrive, at least outside of the professor's door, which is likely slightly ajar because I don't imagine that Maggie had the presence of mind to close it after she paraded down through it. She she did say she put herself between him and the door, so I assumed she did close the door. Fair enough. We'll say that the door is closed. I think Fraser will assume that if he's heard Maggie screaming, she's screaming is coming from her room. Yeah. So that's where he runs to, unless unless there is more screaming coming from Richard's room. Yeah, she has not stopped. Well, okay then. He'll he'll, uh, he'll run to the to the door and hammer on the door, and then just burst it open if it's not locked. Point of fact, Professor, you're not completely clothed, yes? No, I think he's probably just got his underwear on, and he's um, well, he was going to get his dressing game, but he's been otherwise uh, hmm, occupied. Is that the word? Distracted. Uh, so the phrase, Fraser, this is Fraser. This is the scene you open up on. Mm. The professor attempting to assist Miss Bellinger. She has the device on her head. He is in a state. She is in a state. And you can tell from her movements that she's bleeding from somewhere you're not sure. And then as she pitches and yaws around here in the in the room trying to get it off, you see that her nose is streaming with blood down the front of her clothes. What the bloody hell is going on here? What have you done, Professor? I have what? Well, Go and get Paul device. right now. No, no, Go, we, we, man. Must, we, we must get the device off. Go uh, and get Paul. No, do as you're bloody well told. You go and get Paul. I, I'm going to work on this device. This is. I, I need to get this off. And Fraser will just slap Richard around the face. Wonderful. So we'll say that that's brawl opposed by dodge or parry, depending on what you'd like, Professor. Um. I think Richard's a sort of dodgy kind of person. I think he's going to try and get out of the way. You can you can say that again. 
Right. He's not. I mean, Fraser is is not a pugilist by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, he's not very happy about the situation. It's a bit of a fail from Richard, um, and well, it's a fail from uh, from James as well. Oh, wonderful! We have a we have a multiple fail question. So I'll say that uh, Professor, you duck out of the way, and uh, Mr. Fraser, you, you can't seem to get a. Uh, you swipe at him, but uh, but he's moved and. And is that is he shielding himself with Maggie? What an ungentlemanly thing to do! Bounder, sir. So he would just as best he can. He'll just push push Richard away and uh, attempt to uh, assist Maggie with getting the device off. Go and get Paul. No, I won't tell you again. In this state, this chaos that has erupted in your your hotel room, Richard, I'm going to have Maggie roll a d10 for me. Certainly can do that. Mm-hmm. That is an eight. Assumptions. What what is Richard wearing right now? Perhaps he could explain it for our uh, U.S. listeners as well. Uh, I should probably explain it in different terms. So Richard is wearing um, long johns. So it's like a um, I don't know if that's a thing in America, but it's kind of like a vest and some sort of um, trousery type things. So I think. When the penny drops that uh, Richard is in a state of undress, Fraser will just bawl at him and put some bloody trousers on, man. You're a disgrace. Well, I, I, I was interrupted. Um, I don't wish to know. Can't you see that? Get out. Go and get Paul. And and he'll struggle with with um, with the, the device on Maggie to try and get off her face. Certainly. Um, so, Mr. Griffith and Miss Mrs. Griffith. Sorry. Are the two of you doing anything after uh, Mr. Fraser leaps from the table? I'm following after him, but at a more sedate pace. I'm way too tired to be running after yesterday's exertions. Simon will gesture upstairs to Mia. Are you coming? Mia has uh, one pastry in her mouth. She snatches another one off the table and she is on Fraser's heels. Uh, Simon will bring up the rear. If he's running, he's not going to bring his coffee. It'll spill everywhere. Soon after this altercation with uh, the professor, um, Mia and Simon, you hit the doorway and you can see that all sorts of just chaos is going on. There's blood all over the floor. Uh, There are people struggling with Maggie to get something off of her head. Oh, oh, oh my listening to uh, Mr. Frazier screaming at the doctor to get um, whomever this Paul is, which isn't on her radar. Uh, she's going to look over to her husband and say, uh, what what room is Paul in? I'll, I'll get him. He's down the hall there. Welcome to the show, Mia. Front row seats, right? And she turns on her heels and she'll go towards whomever Paul is. She's going in a blind. Okay. And Lady E comes in and sees the professor in a state of undress and Maggie screaming, and she's going to wrap him over the knees with her cane for inappropriate behavior. What what on earth are you doing? Professor Courtney, what on earth do you think you're doing? I am... Hearing before a young unmarried woman in a state of undress. I was disturbed. I was, um... I'll say. Bed and... Um, Miss Bellinger decided to enter the room. And you didn't think to put clothes on before putting the device on her face? I was trying to. No, you weren't. I'm going to stab the cane into his foot one more time for emphasis. Before showing young women your device, you should at least have the decency to put some trousers on. Mia, you get to this door and you knock on it, and a young gentleman... Uh, answers the door. He seems to have a like a working suit on, uh, like he's doing work at a pharmacy or a, a local bank or something like that. Uh, can I help you? Oh, hey, you're cute, uh, Paul. Uh, y- yes. I'm. I'm sorry. I. You are. We'll do the cute introductions later. There's a mild emergency in room insert room number that they're in. Oh. Oh, the professor. Um. Oh, yes. Hang on. He spins around. You see him grab a black leather doctor's bag and he leaps out the the doorway and begins heading down towards the room. 
if he's moving with that much urgency, when he leaps out of the door, can she leap in? To his room? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's not on her radar, so she needs to figure out what's going on with this. Certainly. And she can't help with whatever the fuck is going on there anyways. <laughs> uh, so just at first uh, glance, she would see what looks like a chemistry set, a set of books, and some things in a Petri dish that look like some kind of custard, maybe? It's hard to say. It looks... Okay. This all looks medical. Or maybe chemical. Who are you, Paul? And she'll do... I mean, this is super fast. Like, she's... Yeah. Just, Running through drawers, quick flip through journals, looking under the mattress, like knocking one of the petri dishes with like her pinky nail. This is a quick sweep of impression of who this individual is. Give me a spot hidden roll. 48. Oh, I wish it were better than that. It's just a regular success. Okay. So it doesn't need to be a hard success necessarily. Uh, you go into his nightstand, which is uh, just fairly close by, and you find some rather, we'll say, hedonistic literature. Really? There's, yes, yes. Featuring men and women together, women and women together, and men and men together. Is this a book, a pamphlet, several books? Give me an idea of what I'm looking at uh, as far as quantity. It's, uh, it's probably six to eight sheets, maybe, of paper that likely didn't come from the same source, but they seem to be collected. So she's going to take all of those and she's going to walk out of the room with them in her hand as she's like flipping through them. Like, huh, this group gets funnier and funnier. My report is going to be hilarious. And then she's going to go back towards their room. Mr. Fraser, you do get the device off of Miss Bellinger. You have helped take it off before. And so, you know, just about the way to remove it from someone's head. And uh, at this point, Miss Bellinger, you come out of the effects of the, the lenses uh, and see the room around you and the blood all over the place. And you suddenly begin to feel pain in your face. And you have a different look on life. So I'll, I'll, I will take her arm and uh, I will gu guide her to a chair and, and, and sit her down and say, uh, don't, don't, don't worry. touch me. Don't worry. Ball's coming. Your face is bleeding, Miss Ballinger. I I don't need your help, and I don't need Paul. I don't need any of you. Uh, are you okay, Maggie? No, I'm not okay, Richard. You no. I was in a horrible, terrifying place. There was nothing I'm... and everything all at once. You were there. You were just light, and you were. It was terrifying. What What did it look like? A young woman comes into your room and throws herself at you, and all you can think to do is put this on my face. Well, um, I mean, you, you, that, that, I, I thought that's what you wanted. You thought that's what I wanted when I fell on you next to your bed. Well, How I, dense are you? I thought you tripped and fell, as I did when I got out of the bed. You're all going to get me killed. I'm never going to see my family again. Oh, it, Paul is on his way, Miss Ballinger. You, you'll, you'll be fine. It's, it's. Uh... Paul might be the worst of all of you. And Fraser doesn't really know what to say to the, this outburst. He's... Miss Maggie, you are absolutely right. Professor, you are fairly clueless. Um, I don't know what you mean. Precisely. Now put some trousers on. Richard, you were practically naked when I came in and I was okay with it. I touched your hands. I, I, I know, but I mean, it was, um, I mean, what would Mr. Fraser say? I, um, I was just going for my gown. Mr. Fraser was not here. It was just me, a uh, me and you alone in your room with the door shut. No one would have known. We would have just been a little late for breakfast. But no, the only way to get to Richard is through the device. It's like you're more interested in that thing than me. I well, no, 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 no. I, uh, that's that's not true. We are all still in Maggie's room, correct? No, this takes place in Richard's room. Oh, I thought they had moved over to Maggie's room. I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. Because Richard was getting dressed. If Richard was getting dressed in Maggie's room. Totally different story. Miss Maggie, I suggest you suggest you head to your room. Professor, I suggest you get dressed. And... I suggest you mind your own goddamn business, man. Paul steps in. Is this a bad time? 
Uh, Paul, Paul, um, Miss uh, Bellinger has uh, sustained some injuries to her face. I wonder if you might uh, have a look and make sure she's uh, she's not seriously harmed. Uh, sure. He kind of looks a little sheepish at you, Maggie. Like, do you really want me to come over there? I, I think if if I'm going to assist her, perhaps we could clear the room a little bit. There's an awful lot of people in here. Yes, yes, of course. That's a, a, a very good idea. Let's do that. Uh, let's le- leave uh, leave you to your your, uh, your business. You don't have to tell me twice. Let's just run away. You're scared. Mia, you arrive outside the room with fly, fly. Your, your papers. And she'll just fold them in half and just kind of have them in one of her skirts. Okay. Paul sits down near the, the bed and offers you something to clean your nose with. Oh, hello, Mia. Uh, everyone uh, that hasn't met Mia, this is our our new friend Mia. Mia, if a young lady showed up in your room while you were in a state of undress and practically threw herself at you, would the first inkling of a thing to do be to put some sort of time-space-traveling evil device on their face? No. My first instinct wouldn't be to get dressed either. Looking at Richard... I mean, sorry, Maggie, but if that woman were you and then she's going to throw this look over at Courtney like, huh, you blew that one. Uh, no, the device would be the last thing on my mind. Thank you. I just thought that's what you meant. Uh, by the way, Simon, this is what I meant about a liability and a firecracker being together. It's a bad call. We've lost an hour already. At this point, oh. Richard connects the two and realizes that this was the person in Simon's room. Cats. I like how you think. You are a driven person, and I am always telling this group that we need to spend less time on personal matters and that we need to find these pieces, regardless of whether or not it's going to kill me, apparently. Poor lamb. Sorry, Dr. Corduroy, you really dropped the ball on this one. I think we just need some more copper. Um, That's all that's needed here. And that will protect That'll you. fix it right up, won't it, Richard? Just give the lady more copper. Okay, so... Paul gives you, a, again, gives you another tissue for your for your nose and then says, uh, provided the, the bleeding ceases, you should be just fine, I, I think. Uh, he then looks around at the even larger assembly and says, um, I'll, I'll be back in in my room if you need me he stands up and wanders his way through the rest of the group till he gets outside of the hallway thank you Paul as soon as he passes Mia um, she's going to put a hand on his chest that has um, his papers on it mm-hmm. and she's going to say curiosity without judgment it's fine he takes the papers and because he doesn't know what they are he looks down for a moment and then puts them very close to his suit um, th- thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And he ducks out. Well, are we quite done with the hysterics for the moment? Professor Courtney, a word in private, if you'd be so kind. Well, okay. Kind of take him a little bit down the corridor. Professor, have we not already discussed the placing of your uh, item on other people? I'm not quite sure disgust is um, quite the word. What do you have to say for yourself, ma'am? Well, I thought that's what she wanted. She came in and uh, asked me how I was. And you did not think to get dressed before answering the door? Um, uh, I don't think I had much of a chance, if I'm honest. Oh, what, she just barged into your room, did she? before you'd had a chance to put some trousers on. Well, I wouldn't want to uh, damage a young lady's reputation, but... Um, well, then you shouldn't have had her in your room. I had very little choice. Your door was not locked? Uh, no, no, I don't believe it was. Oh, I see. So Miss Ballinger just forced her way into your room, and uh, you were able to do nothing about it, so you decided to put this device of yours on her face. Well, that's with a... the resultant screaming and bleeding that we all witnessed. Are you out of your mind, man? 
I don't know what's going on anymore. Well, that much is very evident. But I will tell you this, sir. If you do something like this again, without any other members of the party present and in agreement, then I will thrash you, Sarto, within an inch of your life. Do I make myself quite clear? Yes, perfectly. I Good. think you've made yourself clear on a number of occasions. Yes, well, it doesn't seem to have sunk in, does it? Because you're still doing it. Yes, quite. Now, about turn, sir. Get yourself ready for breakfast. We'll discuss the matters of the day. And Bridget will just sort of mope back to his room. Yep. And on that note, I'm going to call this episode to a close. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Horror on the Orient Express. We look forward to seeing you again real soon.